Okay, members. Uh, Stuart Dixon has given notice of an urgent oral question to the Minister for the Economy. I would remind members that if they wish to ask a supplementary question, they should rise continually in their places. The member who tabled the question will be called automatically for a supplementary. Clerk, please read the question. To ask the Minister for the Economy when Part B of the COVID-19 Business Support Scheme will open to support businesses in the direct supply chain of other businesses required to close or cease trading. And I call the Minister for the Economy. Minister. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, Mr Speaker, in responding to this question, it is worth clarifying that there are two schemes currently in operation. It is unfortunate that some members of this House have either deliberately or otherwise conflated the two and so have thereby created confusion amongst many people seeking support. The Local Restriction Support Scheme is run by the Department of Finance. This was designed to provide support to businesses mandated to close, operating from premises, and so makes up the vast majority of the support available. I know that members of this House will, of course, be keen to hear the details of the progress of this scheme uh, when the Finance Minister is next in the Chamber. My department has put in place a scheme to provide support to those who are not covered by the Department of Finance scheme. Part A of the COVID Business Restriction Support Scheme is for those mandated to close but not recorded in the rates database. It is therefore a much smaller scheme. It was important to get Part A up and running as it is directed at individuals with very small businesses and who are unlikely to have cash reserves. By the end of this week, more than 1,000 small businesses will have received payments amounting to more than 3 million. Part B is for companies that make up the supply chain of businesses mandated to close. It is my expectation that Part B will open on Wednesday, and I have asked InvestNI to ensure that they have the dedicated, necessary resource to make that happen and to respond as quickly as possible. However, again, let me be clear to this House, and I'm sure all members in this House would agree, that as custodians of taxpayers' money, it is imperative that we have the necessary controls in place to reduce, insofar as it is possible, the risk of fraud and error around the various schemes that departments are asked to bring forward. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, Stuart Dixon, um, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, Minister, for coming to the House. We really are going to have to stop meeting like this, but we're not going to stop meeting, I guess, until I get answers to questions on behalf of those people. On that who, note, will you come to the question? I, just I like will to, come um, to my question. Sorry. Minister, on Mr. the 20th Dixon, of May Mr. Dixon, uh, this year... Stuart, could you just sit down a wee second? Before we move into this session here, I just want to urge members to please move quickly to their question, because members in the last session were not able to get into the queue because people were taking too long to introduce their question. So go ahead, Stuart. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Minister, on the 20th of May, you told the Economy Committee that you wanted to ensure that as much money and support would be extended to as many people as possible. Well, Minister, we're still waiting for many people to be included. There are a group of people who will be described as excluded, yet some half a billion pounds of Barnet consequentials remains to be spent. The Finance Minister indicated to this House that he is open to bids on this. So when will you finally make a bid in order to allow people to uh, protect their businesses and stop them falling over? Can I thank the member for his question? Of course, the member is very well aware uh, that I have on any number of occasions asked the executive to make decisions in relation to this matter. Since decisions are exceptionally difficult uh, to make on this issue, um, I have today received a sub to my uh, office, which I hope I will sign off this evening, around support for those who have been recently self-employed and indeed sole company directors. Of course, that will then go to the executive. It will be to the executive and uh, the Finance Minister to decide whether to support those proposals. I call Gary Middleton. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And can I thank the Minister for her answer so far? Uh, the Minister, no doubt, will agree that grants are important, but grants alone will not make up for the loss of earnings for those businesses forced to shut or severely impacted by uh, the executive's restrictions. Would the Minister agree that the best financial support, the best support and help that we can give to those businesses is to allow them to open safely uh, with the proper guidance in place? Yes, um, I would agree. I think, and I've been on record in this House many times as saying that the best support that we can give to businesses is to allow those businesses to open. Um, and I am also on record, um, Mr Speaker, with your permission for a very brief time, as saying that last week was not the Executive's finest star. However, having come to a compromise solution last week, which in essence rolls over the restrictions for two weeks, Bar close contact services, which the Health Minister says provides 0.05% uh, to the R rate, and the opening of coffee shops, other than that, it's rolled over for the next two weeks. Yet the Health Minister again on television, but not to this House, on Sunday said that he would be asking for further restrictions. Today I have spoken to a number of people within the hospitality sector who are extremely annoyed and disappointed that the, the rules of this game keep changing all the time. And I would urge the Health Minister to indicate to this chamber and indeed to the hospitality sector what he wants them to do in order to open safely so that we avoid a repeat of last week. Um, and if he can't uh, tell us that they can open safely, then what is he saying to the 65,000 people whose jobs depend on tourism and hospitality? I can't take a point of order during the question time. So I'll call John O'Dowd. Thank you. Minister, what, what would you say to the businesswoman in my constituency who said to me during the week that if the economy minister spent less time doing the health minister's work and more time doing the economy minister's work, that whole business may have a future? Where do you get the money out the door into those businesses that, uh, that require it? I think that the member would actually need to clarify for me whether he was talking to a business with a rateable premise. If that business owner had a rateable premise, then of course um, that would be for the finance minister to look at. Um, I launched uh, the scheme uh, that we have currently running uh, whenever we saw the parameters of the finance scheme. Um, and we will, of course, get the money out as quickly as possible. However, in answer to the main thrust of your question, I don't see a contradiction between a healthy community and a healthy economy. If we allow that economy to go to wreck and ruin, if we allow unemployment to grow, then we will increase mental health problems. We will increase death. Poverty brings incredible um, health, um, negative health outcomes for people right across Northern Ireland. It's a tricky and difficult balance. And I think you will see the agonies that people genuinely went to last week to try to get that balance. Um, and therefore, um, I think that we now need to look at how we have a functioning economy and a health service that can service the needs of all of our patients. You call it Sinead McLaughlin. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And can I just say it's regrettable terminology that the Ministry has used to suggest that this is a game in any shape, form or fashion. But anyway, many businesses in my constituency are small family owned businesses. Perhaps two or three members of the same family actually working in those businesses. And to date, they're in their seventh week of having absolutely no support through the Part A scheme. My question is, based on the experience of the Part A scheme, uh, and I welcome the fact that we've got a timeline now for Part B, can the Minister guarantee that Part B grants will be put out very, very quickly, and can you guarantee that we, they will be paid before Christmas? Again, I would ask the member to clarify whether the businesses she's talking about have a rate base. If they employ two or three people, it suggests 
that they have a rate base if they've been waiting for seven weeks. It suggests that they are part of the original localised restriction scheme run by the Department of Finance. And if that is the case, then I would advise the member to address her questions uh, to uh, the Minister for Finance as the Minister responsible for operating the scheme. As I have said in this chamber, and I will continue to repeat in this chamber, Part A of this scheme is for those businesses that don't have a premises, those who operate on a mobile basis, the driving instructor who operates maybe with some ads on Facebook, his mobile telephone number, and makes appointments. We are currently working our way through about 2,500 applications to that scheme, and by the end of this week we'll have paid out over £3 million within that scheme. We will endeavour to get the rest of that money out as quickly as possible with as much assurance as we can um, so that this House can be satisfied and I can be satisfied that taxpayers' money is appropriately spent. Part B of the scheme is, of course, for businesses um, that have a, a number of customers but that part of their supply chain is impacted um, by the, the restrictions. You will understand, I think this House will understand why we wanted to directly imp uh, um, target those people who had no income whatsoever, first of all. That is what we've done. Part B, we hope, will be out on Wednesday. And of course, we will pay as quickly as we can, given the assurances that are required in order to make sure that taxpayers' money is well spent. And I call John Stewart. <coughs> Speaker, I thank the Minister for answers so far. Um, you rightly say that the businesses that applied for this scheme are ones that have limited cash flow, and that is a serious problem for them, especially in the conditions they face. I had a phone call just before we came in here from, from a lady that rents a chair in a salon, and after three weeks of having the application with no updates um, by email or from, from your department, she's received an email today asking for her accountant's details. She doesn't have an accountant. She can't afford an accountant. How has it taken three weeks to get to this point? When will they get their money? And how is it that as of Friday, given the accreditation that driving instructors have from the department to say that they exist, not one in Northern Ireland had received their money as of Friday? And will the people who have been asked to extend automatically get a payment, or will they have to reapply, Minister? Um, the particular issue around the extension is one um, that we will have as an executive to make a decision on. However, I would suggest, since that Part B is not operational, it can be extended automatically. The Part A will be a more difficult conundrum to deal with, um, but we should be able to overcome that um, reasonably quickly. I don't see any particular problems in it. Um, I don't want to get into an individual case, um, and I would uh, ask, I mean, there is a helpline, there are people in Invest NI who are manning the telephones uh, every day uh, in order to uh, iron out these problems, and I would ask your constituent to contact them and to make sure uh, that uh, the issues that she is raising uh, are properly raised with those who are, who are administering the scheme uh, and who will point her in the right direction. Call Andrew Muir. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. The, the Minister referred to this as a game. I would profoundly disagree with her. It's a horrendous nightmare. And the people of Northern Ireland are looking to this place and they're looking to the executive to come together to safeguard lives and livelihoods. And I think that's incumbent upon us all to do that. In relation to Part B, will this cover supply chains such as, for example, recruitment agencies and extend beyond what the traditional reference would have been to uh, food and uh, produce? Thank you. Part B, the businesses, um, and this is uh, readily available on the NI Business uh, Info, so business supplies, uh, the business will, will apply, Part B will apply if the business supplies goes to a business named in the regulations. This includes businesses that supply goods directly to a business named and those that supply via wholesaler or intermediary. If it is a food business, those food businesses must be licensed and registered uh, by the local council. It can also apply to businesses whose services are directly to a business named in the regulation um, and uh, those are those that supply via a, a subcontractor. It also can supply um, to a business that does not supply goods or services to a business named in the regulation but is dependent on those businesses being opened in order to operate, for example, businesses in the events sector. This is a fairly wide-ranging scheme, uh, Mr Speaker. 
It's not intended uh, to exclude. It's intended to be as inclusive as we can, hence the different categories of businesses that we have included. But they must be tied to the local restrictions that were announced on the 16th of October. And that's the main um, part of it. I call Gordon Dunn. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Speaker, and thank the Minister for her answers today. I understand the Finance Minister, um, Conor Murphy, has currently 500 million, as already has been mentioned. Uh, in relation to COVID funding for the various government departments. Can the Minister of Economy uh, maybe once again emphasise uh, and highlight the bids that has, she has made and intends to make in relation to further support for businesses? And can she give us assurance that that money will be available before the end of the financial year? Can I thank the member for his question? Before I do, uh, with your permission, Mr Speaker, I just want to mention one point uh, that Mr Muir raised. I don't consider this a game. Actually, I know so many people who are extremely stressed, anxious, people who are um, facing perhaps unemployment, people who don't know where to turn to get Christmas over. This is not a game. Um, can I also say, um, in relation to additional funding, Yes, um, I have made a number of bids, as I continue to do, to the Finance Minister. Um, last week, I wrote to the Finance Minister and asked him um, to consider extending the 12 months rates relief to the manufacturing sector. And manufacturing generates about $6.4 billion to the economy, accounts of about 11% of all employees within the economy. Um, and while we have the funding to do so, even though um, we have an unparalleled derating scheme for uh, manufacturing businesses in Northern Ireland, unparalleled with throughout the United Kingdom, I think that in these very difficult circumstances, this would be an easy win for manufacturing um, and something that we could do relatively simply. I have also, as I've said, um, I'm currently um, finalising and hope to get uh, executive approval for a scheme for those who have been recently self-employed. I have been looking at a scheme for further tourism supports um, for those large um, tourism businesses that did not fall into the 51K bracket um, in uh, the previous rate schemes, also for bed and breakfasts. Um, I have been looking at supports for um, some licensed premises that have been continuously closed. Um, over the period of this time, and I think that there could be some um, additional support through an extension of the hardship scheme to include companies with more employees than the, the previous hardship scheme. So, um, yes, significant number of bids, and those will all be assessed in the coming days. I call Keith Archibald. I thank the Minister for her response and for um, giving the details at that timeline and also for the update in relation to, to Part A of the scheme and what is intended to be paid by the end of this week. But I'm sure the Minister would understand why people were concerned given that it's a fortnight later that these payments are getting out in Part A and Part B hadn't yet opened given the pressures that businesses and the financial difficulties that people are facing. Um, earlier in the uh, Joint First Minister's statement, they outlined that there is additional support um, being made available for businesses. Could the Minister outline what that form that will take and how quickly that will be paid out? Um, again, can I thank the member for her question? And again, I would ask the member to clarify whether uh, she is talking about the scheme run by the Department of Finance or indeed the scheme run by the Department of the Economy, which is much, much newer um, and uh, has moved reasonably well um, given uh, the complex nature of the scheme. Um, if it's a business in the North West, um, as uh, my colleague over on the other side of the House has indicated, waiting seven weeks, um, then that almost certainly uh, uh, um, uh, relates to the localised uh, restriction support scheme. Um, so um, we need to be very clear about the schemes that we're talking about and not conflate the two. Um, and of course that's easy to do on social media or for a quick soundbite, but for people actually requiring support, that's not the best way forward. And I take that very, very seriously. I have done numbers of schemes uh, for people right across Northern Ireland and we try to get money out as quickly as possible 
with as much assurance as possible, and that's very important. I have given an indication of the different schemes and the additional supports, of course, that I uh, am working on. The executive will, uh, probably on Thursday, uh, take decisions around further and additional supports, um, and I am open to looking at uh, any of those uh, ideas that executive colleagues bring forward. The member will also know that the finance minister has asked um, for uh, further bids in relation to the 500 million that he is currently holding, and I have indicated some of those bids that we are currently working on. Thank you, and I call Matthew O'Toole. Uh, Mr. Speaker, Minister, last week your department published a paper um, on the expected economic impact analysis, a research paper on the expected economic impact from the four-week closure. Um, it suggested £120 million uh, direct and, and more indirect, up to £400 million. I think you've quoted the numbers today. But it also says, Minister, this figure is assuming, quote, a swift reopening and bounce-back effect once restrictions are lifted. How can that be the case when we still have hundreds of new cases a day, the highest infection rates in these islands? Can I ask you to go back to your officials and ask them to, to test the assumptions they're making in these papers? And can you also please give us a, a, a numerical update on precisely how much money has been granted under Part A of the Department scheme? Thank you. Um, again, the paper that the member refers to, um, like much um, of the work that we're doing, is modelling around the impacts on the economy. And of course, it did um, have as its premise that restrictions would be lifted and people would be allowed uh, to trade um, in a freer manner um, than we currently are. Um, the compromise solution that the executive came to uh, last week um, will see all of the restrictions continue bar, as I've said in this house before, the one for close uh, contact services, which the Health Minister indicates um, adds about 0.05 to um, the R rate, uh, and uh, the opening of coffee shops. If we are to have a full bounce back of the economy and not increase that 400 million number, then we will have to be in a our economy to operate. And I accept that these are very, very difficult situations for us to be in. I accept and talk on a regular basis to the Health Minister. I accept his sincerity in, in uh, what he um, is putting forward. But we will have to have two things happen. One, we will have to know what the further restrictions are the Health Minister wants to bring. And two, we'll have to know what the proposals are then from Health as to how we break the cycle of lockdowns. These are incredibly difficult unpredictable new circumstances for us all to be in and I think the anxieties of last week uh, are a demonstration of that. I call Steve Egan. Thank you very much indeed and thank the Minister very much for her comments so far. I noticed from her uh, dossier that uh, my previous friend from South Belfast has reported to in it, one of her officials, because I don't think she would have let this go out if she was a minister herself, but maybe she would have. Therefore, it should be noted that the economic and health situation is highly fluid and uncertain that any estimates are only provided in good faith, to the best of our knowledge. For that reason, the estimates below are intentionally not provided with precision attached. Minister, does this refer to your entire approach to helping the excluded of Northern Ireland? And when you say we're going to get information out on Wednesday, can you give a specific guarantee that that information will come out Wednesday? And if it doesn't, will you consider your position, as you should do? Um, I will um, respond to the member's question by saying that the paper that was produced on uh, last week in relation to modelling around the impacts on the economy adopts exactly the same premise that modelling around health impacts that his colleague, the Health Minister, um, produces. These are models. They are not precise instruments, just the same as those around uh, the health predictions or modelling that is given from the health department. So I will um, commend the member for his persistence, but ask him um, to at least um, read the paper and read the premise on which it is done. Um, I um, have... Um, 
and I'm, on a, I'm unsure about which um, section of people the member is referring to. And of course, I will um, try um, in every respect to ensure that they, well, the executive will get a paper from me around those who term themselves as excluded on Thursday. Um, that paper is ready and will be signed off. Um, Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, no amount of shouting at me in this chamber will actually change my mind on how important these issues are um, and how important it is uh, to respond to people in difficult circumstances. So the member um, can uh, shout all he wants in that respect. There will be a paper on the excluded, or, or those who call themselves excluded, uh, on Thursday for the executive to consider and then of course it will be for the executive to decide uh, what to do in relation to that um, and there will also um, be uh, further payments um, as I said by the end of this week under part A um, and the expectation is that part B will start on Wednesday. These are important things and as chair of the finance committee I know that the member would want that money um, to go out with assurance and probity around it although his recent statements might not suggest that. I call Claire Sogden. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker, and thank you, uh, Minister. Um, I just wish to pick up an appointment by Mr Stewart in relation to accountant verification. Um, that in itself has its own cost, and constituents are telling me that they're having to pay their accountants to sign off forms. So I would ask the Minister to consider that, particularly for the scheme that she's bringing forward on Wednesday. Um, I would also ask the Minister if um, she will confirm that those businesses, further to the new restrictions on, on Friday past, will, will get... Uh, the, the various business support schemes, whether they are part closing or, or fully closing um, uh, for, for the two weeks ahead? Yes, um, it is fully intended that those businesses will receive those um, uh, financial supports. I think it is unfair and improper to ask businesses to close and not to support them, um, and we will endeavour to do that. Uh, in relation to the accountants' letters, Many people that I talk to in this chamber, and, um, either individually or within the chamber, will, will know that one of the, the real difficulties in uh, schemes like this is the verification of those applications. So accountants' uh, letters were one way that we could do that um, in the absence of HMRC cooperation in relation to it. I understand that that is difficult for some people, but we do have to have some kind of uh, assurances around taxpayers' money that is being used for the schemes. I hope that that um, does not put people off applying. And I know, and because a number of people have told me that they've phoned the helpline in Invest NI and they have been helped considerably about how they would uh, get uh, these things moving. So I'd advise your constituents to do that and keep in contact. Member Clark, I'm going to try and get one member after yourself, so take a minute, please. Okay, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. And can I thank the Minister for how she has outlaid in terms of her concerns for the businesses that has been affected so dramatically by the, the virus? But given the very difficult decision you found yourself in last week, Minister, uh, and there was a counter view in terms of what they should do or what the executive should do, and I mean, I do believe what was done was the right thing. But was there any, any consideration from all of the other parties who are now concerned about those businesses by extending this lockdown by much longer? Did they express the same concern of you as, as you have expressed all along in relation to those businesses? I think most members in here, whether they agree with me politically or not, cannot um, underestimate uh, the grave concerns that I have for businesses that have been told to close, for people who may lose their jobs, for people who are facing, even under a furlough scheme, 80% of their salary in the run-up to Christmas. These are incredibly difficult circumstances. But what I would say about the executive last week, um, ungainly as it might have been, is that it reflects that very difficult, tricky balance of issues that are out there. And yes, um, it is really important um, that we have a health service that can function, but it's equally important that we have an economy that can function. An economy that is in uh, a poor shape will produce poorer health outcomes, more um, difficulties for communities and individuals, and even death. 
Um, and that weighs heavily on our minds. Thank you. And uh, Linda Dillon, final question. Very quickly, please. Gormay Ogid, can call you? And can I first of all ask the Minister, do you, when you have a, come up with this paper in relation to the excluded, who call themselves excluded because they have been excluded, they've been excluded since March, these are not people that are waiting a couple of weeks, have you actually engaged with those people to ensure this paper will meet their needs? As many members know in this House, I've engaged with a very wide range of people, including um, those people who call themselves the excluded group over a very long period of time. The issues will not change. That members concludes this end of business. Thank you. And, uh, members have received notification from the members of the business committee of a motion to extend the sitting past 7 p.m. Understanding Order 10 brackets 3A. Clerk, please read the motion.